Hi, I'm Hernandez Alonso, I'm the graduate thesis coordinator. I hope I pronounce that right. Uh, my name, <laughs> yeah, my own name. Uh, so what, what we want to do today, uh, I'm going to just talk very, very brief, and then I'll, I'll pass it to me, and then we will pass it to Eric, uh, is just to give a, a, a brief introduction to the exhibition of the best academic thesis work and the four best thesis that were chosen this year and tell a little bit how that happened and how this group was select, selected. Um, and then Nick will make some specific remarks about some of the project and Eric will have a conversation in the same fashion that we do every time that we have a show in the gallery. Uh, he's going to do it with the four students who did the four best thesis. Max Ciotto, uh, Ed Kim, you know, uh, you know you and Sarah Blackenberger, that would be the four one that we will be talking with Eric. Uh, in, 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 the, in the fairness of, four, uh, of full disclosure, this was for good or for bad, Andy Shadow's <laughs> suggestions and idea. So we will hold him responsible for <laughs> the fiasco. For the fi <laughs> I mean, if not, if it all goes, if all goes well, it's teamwork, and if everything goes wrong, it's Andy's fault. Um, but I, what, what, one thing that we wanted to explain to you a little bit is uh, this year actually we have a hard time selecting the work for the gallery because uh, we, we feel that this was probably the strongest year that we have at least since, since me and, and I have been doing this thing with this. this we have a huge, uh, well not a huge, but we have a, a big group of good theses and incredible level of diversity. So um, after the fourth base were chosen, what usually those are chosen by the invited guest critics, they not, none of the higher faculty vote on that. Um, but usually the, the other the other uh, group of teaching that gets selected for the gallery is based on that and that vote, but also the input of different faculties in SIAG and the different directors. So it was a difficult way to come to do this 11 group, which we know is a large group, is the larger exhibition that we have in terms of number of pieces, and it wasn't so much that we wanted to have every work full. It was pretty much that it, we, we thought that this 11 project represents very different ways to approach a thesis, very different way to approach architecture, but we all, we all thought that these were theses and not just projects of architecture. And that's an important distinction that for all of you who are going to come to thesis in the years to come, we'll discuss that in proper detail, what are those differences and so on. Um, also, the four best theses were unanimously chosen. I mean, they all had the same amount of vote, and they were clearly the four that um, step out of, of the rest of the world for all the uh, guest critics. But also, it was more or less unanimous among everybody for the opportunity to show the work. So we always think it's important that the, the thesis work is exhibited in the gallery so they have a longer life than the thesis weekend. So people have the time to come and look carefully. And also this year we wanted to add the possibility to have at least a 10 minute conversation about each of the projects with Eric, uh, as Eric has been doing for the last four or five years with everybody who does in the gallery and also because I don't think that for those uh, jury distribution, I don't think Eric saw, uh, you didn't see in any of the discussion of the one that they were the four best, so we thought this was another opportunity of pain for the students to go through one more before we let you go. So uh, on that note, uh, I'll pass the mic to, to Nick Frank, our grand director. Thank you. Right. No, we promised both Anand and I, we told Eric that this is a, uh, we, we, we will only allow a very small dosage of partnership. Um, I do want to thank Anand for his uh, uh, coordination the thesis effort, but also to all of the those faculty uh, whose commitment we really do see shown on this project on, 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 on which I exhibited here. And um, we have selected 11 thesis project. Eric said, mm, that's quite a lot. And, and it is true, I mean, I, I, it was difficult for us to eliminate. I mean, and um, because we do think, both and I and I, we have a very long discussion, and we thought that they really do represent uh, the, the, the whole 
food and diversity involved to populate. And it is exciting, uh, you know, it is indeed great that we see uh, that each year increasingly you, you see this uh, you know, the project of creatively more interesting, more exciting, more original. And, um, and the, you know, the range of inquiry, the range of the depth of the inquiry, the, the, the variety of the project really kind of does reflect, I think, I believe, the commitment of, of our faculty to the objective of the graduate curriculum, which, uh, uh, which is also the mission of, 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 of SIA, uh, which is to provide the student with the skills and the um, and the criticality to develop your own ideas. So if you look around uh, the, the room, uh, you see that uh, we no longer have like, one notion. In the last year, we always would have you know, the same thing, is either the facade, surfaces, and, um, and, and this year, the, the, the range goes from this immersive, interactive environment through uh, scripting the program, you see more developed thesis project, um, more models. Uh, we are we celebrating you know, a variety, a range of representation. Uh, thank God for the section and plans and everything else. And I know that during the, the thesis uh, discussion, you know, there were discussion whether we, we need the elevation of all the section. I think we still believe that they are good. Uh, in particular, um, section, sectional models are uh, back this year, so, you, you, you know, so that the, the, the discussion between uh, exterior and interior uh, is coming back uh, with all of this model, with, uh, the, the project has developed much more in depth. And, um, and I think that as you as you as you look around, each one of these projects really does bear the uh, the mark of the thesis advisor as well. Um, they have been really committed and very supportive, and I'm sure spend endless of hours with the students, and we do want to thank them. And so um, I'd like to uh, pass this to Barry uh, so that he can just. Uh, okay, gladiators, step to the arena. Miles, where are you? Miles, come in. Come into the center, man. Yeah, it's like a reality show. No, it is. It's just reality. Zago's proposal, Andy's proposal, to do this 
might be a problem, only because for all of you who stand up in front of the usual array of jurors, having worked and not slept and so on, all of that stuff. And it seems to me that one of the difficulties in this process is that the discourse of the discussion almost never lives up to what's on the wall. Never ever. Because it's difficult for anybody to articulate these issues. You've got people who are 20, who are 20 30 years older than you firing away in every direction. And I, so I, I understand the kind of intrinsic inequity in the process. This is a wonderful project. You have to look at this spectacular, profound, beautiful, beautiful project, period. And my guess is we get into the discussion. If you didn't look at the project and listen to the discussion, that won't come out of it necessarily. And so why did you do this? And what does this mean? And should you have turned left when you turned right? And so on and so on. So I think it's, it's important for us, and certainly important for you, to develop the capacity to, articul <coughs> to articulate the work that you do to tell us where it originated, why it is what it is, where it's going, and all of that. But at this point, and maybe forever, I wouldn't make the mistake of confusing the discussion and the content of the discussion with the content of the work. There are four extraordinary characters up here. There are four extraordinary pieces of work. That's what we're here to celebrate. So the next level of kind of analytical <coughs> discussion is useful, is helpful, elucidates, contributes, but in the end, I think we have to say the work is the work, and I think that's why we're here. So we're not here to guillotine the architects or cut up the work, but we are here to talk about some of the issues, and then we'll try to do that, and we'll try to give them plenty of opportunity uh, to, to tell us how they got where they got. Uh, what, what I wanted to do in case, of, uh, one other thing, uh, Need a bill. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but I think you will fit twice. <laughs> you will fit twice. Uh, yeah, I wanted I wanted to show a couple images in, in, in a second because there are not enough images in the room. Uh, but, but the other thing, the other thing I wanted to say, and I, I think this is for me, and I remember walking around in galleries all my life and looking at very extraordinary work and thinking. Get everything else, get everything else out of the room. And one of the problems when I came in there and I hadn't seen the exhibition, I came in to see the exhibition and everything is banging into everything else. And, and it's, this is the way it is, this is the room, it's a big enough room, there are too many projects, the room is too small, whatever it is. But, but what you need is a kind of intellectually, for me, a little bit insular way of not going, you know, uh, you know, this, and trying to understand in a, in, in a focused way what each project means. I mean, you could argue the opposite in a, in a sense that, that they rub off on each other, they juxtapose with each other, and you heard this business about diversity, um, which is not a university. Uh, I don't think that, that my proposition would be that diversity intrinsically is a value for the school. Meaning, let's see if there are 11 projects, we can get 12 opinions. So we don't try to do that. I think what we're trying to do is, is to acknowledge not only the content in, in different directions, but the power of the content. So it's not sufficient, it's not adequate to say, this one means this in terms of digital representation, and this one means this in terms of whatever it means. So this is not so much the issue. It happens, I think, that the power of a number of projects or the powers of those projects are contradictory or different. And I think this raises a different question about where architecture is and where it might go. So what's in the room, I think, doesn't demonstrate an allegiance to a particular point of view, but it demonstrates in a very powerful way, let's say, and it has to, I think that's the operable word, in a powerful way, what possibilities that you all might have in front of you in terms of venues or avenues or possibilities. So I think it's not so much, again, 11, 11 projects and 12 opinions. This is not the issue. It's the power of the, uh, of the individual opinion 
that we're that we're looking for. Uh, anyway, can you can you put those slides uh, or turn off the light? So uh, this is uh, I, I read this book last night. I'm sure you're all fascinated by that. But but I, I wanted to. Uh, so you should read it tonight. If you have a there's no Laker game or something. But I, but what I wanted to do is is the, the this is this is a book about an Egyptian pharaoh. And the reason I show it is because it's a little bit, why the hell are we talking about, about uh, uh, Egyptian pharaohs in a celebration of thesis projects? And I think one of, the, one of the areas of discussion which is of interest to me and perhaps may be of interest to you over a period of time is what, what areas of cultural discussion or human affairs can be brought to bear in terms of the architecture. In other words, what does the architecture mean outside of the column and the beam and the skin and the site and the view and the energy and the client and the budget and all of that? What, are, what areas do we care about in terms of human affairs that might, that might be relevant? <coughs> the book is written by a guy who won the Nobel Prize a few years ago. And what's interesting about it, back to diversity, is that this is a guy who was a pharaoh, and, and those who followed him tried to destroy, tried to destroy every record that he left in order to make it appear, to make it appear that he never appeared. So they tried to, they tried to take, the, he built a city, an alternative city, they tried to destroy the city statues and so on and so on, all this historiography, this historiography that tried to <laughs> destroy all of that, all of the record. So he was a unique guy with a unique role. What the book's about is somebody goes to try to find out who was this guy. And, there, and, and the person who tries to discover that goes around and interviews 10 people. And some people say he's a genius, people say he's an idiot, and some people say he's an introvert, and some people say he's an extrovert, and some people say he's sensitive, and some people say he's in it, profound, and so on and so on. It's actually, it's, it's actually a fascinating book. And it, it really, I put it up because it reminded me, in a way, of the difficulty of forming opinions, substantial opinions. And what's interesting is how many points of view there are, not only on this subject, and he's a very controversial guy, but in the room where we're standing. So this, this, this was, was for me a kind of topical discussion that could be also applied to powerful positions in architecture and interrogating those positions. And somehow for you or the students in the room, trying to understand what crack you might open up or what venue you might find. What's so, what's not so, what works, why does it work? Anyway, next one. Uh, and I, I, what I did, I, <coughs> real quick, in the graduation, I used four labels for the four projects, for the four winners that are, that are here today. And the one to, to my right on the wall, I call, I refer to it as Gothic. And this, it, in my, there are a lot of renditions of Gothic, so this is not a structural discussion. But it does have to do with a very particular sensibility. Uh, and fear and apprehension might be part of that. And I think, uh, let's go to the next one. Uh, just for, for the Gothic author, and now we go to the, to the, to the, north, uh, to the north corner or in the north wall, the western corner. And this one was Rothko. Uh, that's Rothko. You know Rothko, the artist. So this, was, this is my rendition to the, to the graduation of each. So the second one is Rothko. The third one is next, is uh, the scan of the brain. And, uh, and the last one is I have to say again, a very remarkable and very, you know, sometimes you get the things you try to explain, you can't explain, but this is Frida Kahlo. 
and this is uh, this is over here my rendition of three to follow I'm not saying any of these are true although what might be true might have to do with whether you can make your case because in a way every one of these projects tries to make a certain conceptual case and I think in, in, in that sense what I'd like to do is, is not too complicated, nobody should be too nervous, you don't have to be free to follow in Gothic cathedrals, okay? But, 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 but these are ideas, each, each one of these, whether it's a cathedral or a painting, carries with it an idea, an ambition, in the broadest sense of the word. So if the four architects could tell us in a conceptual way, in the broadest possible way, what really is the essential meaning of the projects you did? <clears throat> so we just, I'd like to hear, I'd like to hear it. Ladies first. I would say don't try too hard. You don't have to, you know, give that. <laughs> Okay. Yeah, you already <laughs> have a diploma. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> but, but just try to, to think the issue through. Whether that reference is, is, is useful. Huh? Uh, this is your project. Uh, so, my project I was really looking at um, the idea of the sort of tension between visible infrastructure and visible architecture and trying to. Trying to uh, sort of play off of that tension. So I think it is related to the round code in a way in that it's supposed to hover and sort of be partially there and partially not there. And it's a, an old project in a way. I think that maybe he's trying to like start the, the invisible building with his uh, competition entry and Friedrich Strauss. Me. So Friedrich Strauss. His competition entry that the boss skyscraper was sort of like the beginning of the No, project. I know the project. <laughs> <laughs> I wouldn't have picked that for invisible. This is a little bit. No, it's definitely different. I'm not saying that mine is doing the same thing, but I think it's sort of a part of that lineage. I would say. Maybe the Barnes workout, which is quite different. Um, but okay, uh, let me ask you. Let me just ask you. Yeah. Why? Should, huh? Okay. So wait, why? So there's a proposition that this, that the discourse of this project, which is the one over there. Uh, has something to do with the discussion of visible and invisible. And I think in my terms, or the terms I wanted to try to introduce, the question is, why should we care about that subject? In a, in a human way, for people in the room who aren't architects, you know? I mean, if your mom walked in and you said, Mom, I'm working on visible and invisible, you know, what did you have for lunch? <laughs> you know, but but in a in a in a more profound way, because sometimes these discussions have to do with architects talking to each other and congratulating each other how sophisticated they are, but nobody else knows what the hell they're talking about. In a, in a, I mean, nobody else educated people trying to understand, could you tell us why that subject, again, in the broadest sense, as in those images, why this would be a relevant topic in the pursuit of what might happen to architecture in the future?
is the Rothko argument useful for you or is it relevant? I mean, it's sort of like as an effect, it's relevant. I mean, it's sort of the effect of it. I think my interest was put in more of uh, how how the surroundings are projected on us and how we in turn perceive them and trying to plug that in to each other to create feedback loops. Um, I'd say brain scan was really accurate because the data stream came from EEGs. Um, the reason behind that was um, essentially <coughs> By monitoring neural activity, you can uh, essentially sense your surroundings. So everything you see, you hear, you touch, you smell, you taste is uh, is you know being registered and and uh, in your brain. So essentially, by by examining EEG data, you're, you're it's sort of the dashboard to your experience, and then to use that to drive your experience to start to create feedback loops in our perception of our surroundings. Um, I guess the goal is more or less of how architecture can be started, uh, or how architecture begins to be driven by components that are, are fairly un they exist, but they're not seen throughout our spectrum. And so by uh, transposing them or, or translating them into uh, dynamics that we can experience, how that can alter the space of knowledge. So, so essentially, the subconscious and of our surroundings. So, the, what the architect has done is to use a brain scan as, as or the pattern, is it e, EKG, EEG, EEG waves, to develop a spatial concept. But, so the, the first question, I have to ask the same question I asked of, of the first architect, which is, what makes that subject, which one could argue is a really arcane and very narrowly defined subject? In other words, in all of the discourse, I'm trying to tell you Akhenaten matters. So you, you could agree or disagree, I think I could try to make a case. So now you're trying to tell me that a brain scan matters as a conceptual premise which from which a pro forma develops that has to do with making space. So what is the what is the case, what is the argument for using that point of departure? And by the way, parenthetically, does it matter whose brain it is? address each one. Um, yeah, I would say that it definitely matters whose brand it is. Um, reason being that we all experience everything around us differently. Our, our perception is is organized through filters like memory and, and things like intuition and uh, what we're trying to go, what, what we're trying to do, etc. So I think that um, my experience, for instance, is going to be very, very different than uh, you know, anybody else's. And so how does architecture start to uh, address that, um, sort of those intrinsic factors? And how can it start to be programmed for you and be in the same space? So uh, by, by monitoring these types of things, not so much as a conceptual factor, although that's definitely what it's good, um, but the space, which is next door, um, actually does it in real time. So you can plug somebody in and actually see it. So it's not as much as a concept as it is an actuality of this type of thing starting to work. I want to give everybody a chance, but there, there are a couple of interesting <laughs> aspects to this. It's not, it, it, it seems, <coughs> it seems to me that, that there's, and you mentioned this to me at one point, that the brain in an analytical way, in a medicinal way, has a right side and a left side. And that something is achieved conceptually by an equity between the two sides, a balance between the right brain and the left brain. 
Uh, you did an interesting thing in a way by taking what is conventionally understood to be a three-dimensional means represented in a two-dimensional concept uh, context. 3D representational tool, which is usually stuck on a wall, and now you use the three-dimensional tool to make something which is three dimensions. So I think that strategy of, of re-representing what is two dimensions to make something in three dimensions could be discussed. But whatever the conclusion to that, it seems to me that if, if the epiphany of the brain is a balance between left and right, which gives you a certain kind of focus, which gives you a certain kind of clarity, which is a sort of goal between intellect and emotion. There's nothing in the project that suggests that the brain itself can be moved or coached or understood, that it actually goes somewhere. There's a kind of destination, and at least ideally. Now, you, when you were talking to me, you said that could be meditation, but it doesn't have to be anything which is passive. It could be somebody playing soccer, you know, or the violin, or having a discussion, but in a very focused way. It could be somebody working on the project you were working on. Seems to me that's completely missing from the project. You can't read it. In other words, the possibility that space could be focused, like the brain could be focused, by balancing an analytical component and an emotional component, doesn't show up in the project, does it? Um, I, I think it actually does. If you, if you spend long enough in there, um, the sound, I address you know, space in, in a temporal setting as well, and the sound is actually does what you were talking about. So uh, using binaural tones uh, by altering pitches in very specific moments, you can actually change people's perception of where um, the brain sort of stays in, in a series of whether you know it's a, more of an active sense or, or a relaxed sense. So um, that was actually intentionally put in there to drive you. And, and it takes time for that type of thing. It's not something that you see and experience. It's something that you have to feel by being in there for, a long, for you know, longer, like 10 to 15 minutes, and you'll start to understand. Or you'll walk out very, very calm in that way. So I think that was a Have first you, step in addressing does that happen to anybody? Yeah I, yeah, I think so. I mean, you'd have to ask, but um, from the general consensus, I've, I've gone to that. I mean, but the, the range of how it's affecting people have been drastic. Some people are getting sick. And some but there isn't any explicit explanation that the effort to balance both sides of the brain has something to do with balancing the space. Because it's not a space you would read as anything which has balance in a conceptual way typically read. Absolutely, yeah. It doesn't have that. No, because it's more about uh, possibilities. So it's constantly changing and it has it has a feedback with you. So if there's if there's spots, if you're plugged into it, if there's spots where you start to peak, it brings you down in the way of sound, be it that sounds a, a mechanical radiation. So there, it's, it's a layer of complexity of systems that all have specific principles that are Wouldn't it be better if each person who went in had his or her own brain scan? Absolutely, yeah. And why should your your brain balance me? Yeah, um, absolutely. Or her brain balance you? And, and it, it's set up to do that, actually. Um, it just took like 100 people to go through it. It was difficult, so there's more, this is what it can do, and this is sort of the experiences it can make. Try to talk about the you and Frida Kahlo. Me and Frida Kahlo. I think to put it in a more humanized way, I would think that what I was trying to do was to kind of put people off, not off balance maybe, because the whole thing was like I just on the back and you don't even know where the, door, the window is. And so, in the same way, I think her painting was compositionally. Intrinsically, I think that the 
sensation of what we are as humans when you go to a building is actually the same. In that if you go through that and you hear the sound of silence, then like in, if you go to a church, you hear the sound of silence. And even though it does not look anything like a church, it has the same quality because of the, the geometry you know, that I use for the building. And, uh, <laughs> Could you, no, could you say a little bit more about the sound of silence? The sound of silence was, if you were to enter the building, I imagined it, actually, I built it such that um, if you have a thick wall, like if you go to a cave, you kind of hear a warm, warm, warm kind of thing. And the same thing I used within there, because it's an enclosed space, you hear the sound of silence, and that's actually planned for a theater where you go through, and then there's silence before you go into it deeper and deeper to review the inner workings of the theater, which is the play. So it's going through different layers of the building to ultimately get the price. I want to you said Alice in Wonderland, if you looked at that recently. Because the sounds of silence in Alice in Wonderland are two very different kinds of propositions. And I, it's not clear. Are you allowed to speak in this building? Yes. Yep. Does it matter what's in it? What what nominally is the operational use of the building? Does that make any difference at all? I think it does because doesn't have to. Depends on what is the building for those who haven't seen it. What what's nominally? This is a jail, this is a hospital, this is a house, oh, this is... Opera, opera house. Opera house. Yeah. So, I think it does. Because, uh, I don't know. Can you oh. Oh. Uh, I think it does because even functionally, acoustically, it's different than... You wouldn't want to live in there. You or me? Anybody, because you, if you stand on the stage and... I don't know, it's not a house, it's an opera house. <laughs> it's different. Yeah, so I guess. This is a remarkable project. Yeah, why don't you? The uh, Gothic Cathedral? I mean, you're, you're the guy, the, pre the permutation guy. Or the mutability guy. Mutability as permanence. Yeah, is that it? But maybe you could talk about whether the, the image or the introductory image as, because what's, <coughs> for me, of some interest in all of the four images has really to do again with the interrelationship of the language we speak, because it has a certain form or a certain shape or a certain material, but it's no different than somebody who might paint or somebody who might write or something. It's a way of communicating something to me or to you, to yourself, to somebody else. And I guess really the question with the Gothic is, I think it's pretty clear who the constituency is, or who the audience is. And you could probably say pretty clearly what it, what it prioritizes, to whom it speaks. And I wonder in this project, who, who we explain a little bit about, to whom does it speak? What's its constituency? What's its aspiration? In the biggest sense, what is it about? <laughs> well, I guess I'll start and start. I mean, what kind of set in this path or thesis was originally kind of retrospective where I looked back into my previous studios and I guess I discovered certain tendencies that I had and trying to legitimize that what were the tendencies? Well, there's also, well, having taken non-studio, there's also my opinion of kind of cinematic in the back, or cinematic in the atmosphere of Asian era, or kind of working with the existing building fabric as a source of material to build something else. So that kind of got me interested in looking at architectural permanence and how permanent architecture truly is or can be. And instead of kind of, I guess, falling back to looking at virgin territories, virgin land, plotted land as the most ideal place to build, I wanted to look at the site, the existing building, as a source of material to 
to radically redefine it and my intervention to it and understand it in contrast to each other. And as far as the Gothic image goes, I mean, th th there wasn't, a, I think, the association came about not intentionally, but as a byproduct of me trying to create this more of a schematic atmosphere, which I, I, I suppose it's, it's byproduct of my own fascination with architecture representation techniques that I've been playing with for the last couple of so years. So it's, it's a drawing project? Not wholly, but there's a large portion of that is this representation. Well, what is, what is the atmosphere? That you create? Well, when you're doing a project about a process that lasts forever, I think it became problematic because I was thinking, so do I need to finish a, finish a product, a project every time I have a pin up, and at the end of the thesis, I present my projects in a kind of a progressive manner. And that would have been a good idea. You think so? Yeah, I do. And instead of making the proposition a little more credible, right? because you're claiming that's the process. True, and I was hoping that, that by applying that systematic techniques during a presentation, when I explain how I explain the presentation to me is that it's a single frame captured with an infinitely long film. So what you're seeing in front of you is just a single frame. And the reason that the use of atmosphere to kind of reveal and hide certain aspects of the building, or I guess importantly, the top of the building never reveals itself. I guess I often hear critics ask me, where does it go? Not revealing it completely, I guess it's where it goes. I mean, maybe it was infinitely, maybe it was too small. The, the subject, the general subject of the proposition uh, that, that this, the, the essential area of discourse is about mutability or change, and that what you're looking at on the wall here uh, behind the architect is symptomatic of an image of change, which which I have to say for all the beauty of the, the representation of scope, I have no idea, to be honest, what he's talking about. And I and, and, and I can't, and it may be, we're just coming from, from very different vantage points, but it seems to me one of the fascinating subjects that, that deal that, that involves our lives and many lives and history and histories and whatever history is. It's interesting, by the way, because if it were known, they wouldn't keep rewriting it. And one of the things that happens, it's funny, I was driving down there a few minutes ago and I was listening to a sports talk radio, ESPN, whatever it is, and it telling me who's going to win this game and this game and this game and this game. And my guess is, in almost every case, they're probably wrong. They don't actually know it's their job to say. And then tomorrow, they'll get on the radio and they'll explain why what happened happened as if they predicted or as if they understood what would happen in the future, even though they got it wrong. So this is a, a little bit difficult analogy, but what it means is things happen that are not in any kind of conventional pro forma predictable. They're actually not predictable. In, in many cases, the unusual, you know, technology is going this way, history is going this way. If you go back a hundred years to the Russian Revolution, people were telling you, this is history. It's inevitable. Russia, China, Cuba, Indochina, it's all going, and a lot of people were signing up and saying that. It didn't happen that way. In fact, some people who argue now that the 20, history of the 21st century is a rerun of the 18th and 19th. And it, it just seems to me that the language of the, the, the idea of incorporating what you don't know is coming, and I'm not sure how you do that, but I think the first thing you have to do is understand the nature of the subject. And it seems to me you're dealing with change and unanticipatable change. Because if you anticipate it, then it's like, okay, here's a freeway that has five lanes. You know what we're going to do tomorrow? We're going to add two more because they're going to be more. This is not change in any fundamental sense. It's just just doing and a little more of it. You know, the tower is taller, the plane is bigger, the bridge spans further, all of that. I'm not talking about that. But in a substantive way, how a building, the meaning of a building might change, or the meaning of a city might change, the purpose of the building might change. 
all of those things, it seems to me, to reflect those in this image, I think what you did is take a very big subject and give, give a very narrow vantage point to it. It's the, intellectually, is a colossal subject. Nobody, nobody ever mastered that subject. So you're in good company. But people try. What I'm saying is, this, and I said this at the beginning as a preface, that the discussions, it's hard for the discussion to live up to the representational skills that are on the wall. But I think you have to try. I think you have to try. So in a, in a serious way, if this project is really about the permanence of impermanence, and you're not running for mayor on that, it's not a campaign slogan, but you're trying to find a way in architecture to, to, to say that in the language of architecture. I, I think it couldn't possibly look like that. I mean, I just don't think it touches really that subject. It touches a different subject or a number of which you don't discuss, except briefly, which has to do with your previous interests and, and the representational development of those skills and so on. I don't know, you want to comment on that? Well, um, I guess I haven't been here for the last two and a half years, or six, five semesters or so. Um, I've noticed that because Maya, we design perspective and we read her perspective. I mean, when I was in high school, I worked for an architectural office, it's just a hardcore old school, and I did, you know, pretty much other renders on my it was elevation. And, and, and back at that point, when we didn't really have any technology, I mean, they didn't use it, I'm sure there was the technology that. that Perspective is a very expensive thing, time consuming, and we only use it in a very kind of particular way. And I think there was an overindulgence of that technique when I got here because everything was digitized. It was just so easy to just extract perspectives out of mind. And, well, one, this pragmatic reason why this is all done in the graphic view, one was because there were so many books around it, it was really hard, difficult to actually take a perspective shot of the building without having to delete some buildings, which was what happened in that perspective shot to get that. Um, I wanted to kind of go back to that, where you kind of took the um, control into your own hand instead of letting the software to the top for you. So the majority of these renderings are done not just in mental rain, but also taken into Photoshop and using hands-on tablet techniques to actually redefine them to suit my needs and my requirements. So, I mean, the time element was a factor in my thesis, and kind of to represent that, I wanted to show degradation of material and to kind of inject into it a very particular atmosphere. It was required that I put my own hand and my own authorship into the work instead of letting the software at the top. Right. I, I, a couple of things uh, in terms of your remarks. One is that the technology of discussion has to, it has to be clear whether you're talking about the technology in terms of the capacity that we have to build things, or whether you're talking about the capacity we have to represent things, to draw things. <coughs> because if there were more of what it would take to understand what it might mean to build that, or even if you had taken, it, it's funny, and I don't want to defend either, either vantage point, but you talk about the guy you were born with, you know, there may be an argument that, that if you send 50 guys out to build a brick wall, and you go out and you build a brick wall, even if it's just a little piece, this, this, is, this is useful in terms of understanding a little bit more in a tangible way, in terms of weights and forces and all of that. I think it's why over a long period of time there's been some discussion at SIRE about the interrelationship between models and drawings and, and the interest in implementing what you draw. And in order to implement what you draw, there has to be some willingness or not, you know, I sketched it on a plane, I, I rendered it in Rhino Maya, and then I went to Cancun, sat on the beach, and sent it to the engineer in London, the fabricator in Kansas, and they built it in Singapore. You know, 
and, and this junction of the processes in architecture, which I think in many ways are inevitable, and I don't say this, this in, in an entirely pejorative way, but some capacity to understand the pieces that allow you to move the pieces around. So if you know a little bit about the guy with a the wall, then when you come to the drawing, it says, please build a brick wall horizontally. You can do that. You can do that. But it's nice to understand that you understand something about that. I would say, in this context, it's very difficult, not only the conceptual issue of time, but very difficult to understand the meaning of this as something that, that where there's any interest at all in the issue of constructing. I mean, to a certain extent, I, I think these are very useful. I mean, the process of thesis to actually experiment and bring some of the design to reality, but allow the reality to push back to design. So, I mean, this one was the very first one I built in the first review I had, which was just basically trying to recreate the existing building with a bit of my own conceptual uh, idea injected into it. And using that as a, as a springboard, I basically went this one, which was a midterm, which I think you were there. And, I suppose the most complex one was the final, which you know, has the most exotic amount of geometry. Let me ask you, and, and, and we just discussed this with another architect. Does it matter what the purpose of the building is, what the use of the building is, or who inhabits the building, how that matter? No. Let me, let me, the answer is it doesn't matter, and this, this is an acceptable answer, although it seems to me if somebody wants to say that the use of the building or the inhabitation of the building is not relevant, there's a corollary, which is, please tell me why it isn't. And if it isn't relevant to a topic where the building is changing, nominally because the content is changing, then what is relevant in making the argument that the pieces are mutable? How are we making those pieces? And I think in, in a more general sense, for, for those of you who are listening to the discussion and anticipating in another 20 minutes you'll be here and, and having a kind of similar discussion, I think it's important both to, to appreciate the effort and the content and also to see some of the difficulties and the limitations. I wanted to go back to, to should we finish or is this, we should finish? Okay, so we've done it, but I, I, I wanted, there was one other uh, uh, question I wanted to ask of you, if you don't mind, because in some ways, your two projects, the, the Rothko project and, the God, and, and, and your project, as images of possible strategies, conceptual strategies, it would be interesting to have you criticize hers and have her criticize yours. You know the one? This, this one in the corner. I won't ask you to do that, okay? No. Yeah? But, but, yeah. But, but because, it, because it forces you to deal with your own ideas relative to somebody else's, you know, that, that presumably you would take seriously, if not as seriously as you take your own. But, but I also had the feeling that if you look at the building you built, I mean, you're offering, your argument in a way is you're offering the alternative to this, except you're offering the alternative in a more contemporary sense. This is presumably some assumption about what might happen in the future. It's certainly not, although I think I could make an argument it may be happening already. This is the reason for the, for the God thing. But in any case, it's a proposition which says there's a very different way to see. But you never dealt with a section of the building or the plan form of the building at all. So of all the topics that conceptually could interest us in terms of making a building, so the only topic of this thesis is the surface of the building. And even the surface of the building doesn't deal with all of the, you know, so now that people are making high-rise buildings and they're so efficient in terms of green and so without getting into all of this, yeah, that they sell back the energy to the city. You know, this, this is, so this is a, a big argument. The developer should build your building that looks like this 
and not like this, because if it looks like this, then it makes so much energy with the wind and the sun and the moon and all of that, that, that it, there, and, and the configuration is ratified by the relationship to the elements. So, but it doesn't deal with that. It's a very abstract proposition. So, of all the issues, I think in a way I'm saying the same thing, maybe with one exception the other thing, the same thing to everyone. However intriguing or captivating or beautiful are the, are the projects, they actually are not very ambitious in a human way, in a broader sense, in terms of all of the things one could imagine that, that a building would be obligated to do. And it's interesting, in a revolution, what they called modern architecture, which was probably only interesting from 1919 to 1921 or something. But when, when there was, at least on the part of some people, an enormous ambition to remake architecture because of new conceptual possibilities, to remake and re-understand in a different world, in a different city, the lives of the people who would be part of the discussion. And nobody here has expressed any interest in that perspective on what it means to make buildings and cities. You don't hear that. Anyway, you could comment a little bit. I think the question to, to try to distill it a little bit is of all the subjects that could be at issue in a contemporary high-rise, if we wanted to challenge the prototype, who makes a new high-rise building? What is the prototype? Your project, your project is not concerned with most of those opportunities. It's only concerned with one. So could you, would you mind talking about that? Or telling us why this is, or telling us it's not true? Um, well, I definitely, mine, and also the program doesn't matter, but mine, the, the program doesn't matter to mine either. And the reason for that is because I was looking at the One Wilshire Building and at other internet exchange points, which were office towers, which became occupied by by uh, internet infrastructure, and so essentially became big computers. So there was a sort of like they were changing in terms of their use, but it's also implied that they're going to change again. And so I wasn't concerned with working at the program for that reason. I was interested in getting the generic building, um, and then I definitely the ability of the skin to perform in more than one way, in more than the physical way, was something that was an early ambition of mine and it just didn't pan out for the, for the, because I decided instead to focus on what I actually did. I mean, it just was a, a bit of pieces. One more, one more question, very quick. I just want all the architects, quickly, the architects to say, why did you win? Why did you win? And this is the end. <laughs> <laughs> what, is, what is there that's meritorious in a project? Yeah, why should it why should it be acknowledged as a special project? I think there's a... What's good about it? Okay, well, I mean, I think there's definitely a push forward in experimenting about architectural representation. I think that's something that set me apart from the rest of my peers. And not only in flat 2D formats, but also in animation as well, where I can experiment with still images and creation of that and such. So you're good.
not render, there's not perspective. It's, um, but also like taken very seriously. It's done very rigorously, so there are huge drawings and a model that required like 40 people together. Oh, I'd have to say, because I, I, I guess I built it to be experienced, so it was a one-to-one -one opportunity that, that you could actually, I came here for that reason, um, to, to build, to actually experience. And um, when you go in, you can sort of make up your mind for yourself, but I think that would probably be... Uh, for sure. If you really make it, it feels great. Thank you very much.